Church, open your Bibles. We are back in the David series, back in the book of 2 Samuel. Today is chapter 12. If you were with us last week, you know that uh, we're making it through the story of David, and uh, today is part two of what we started last week. So if you weren't with us last week, let me bring you up to speed a little bit, because today's part two of the story. David is king. He's set. He's finally got Jerusalem. All is at peace around him. And he ends up uh, staying at home while he sends his uh, warriors off to battle. He's out one night on his uh, uh, platform that's at the top of his house, just enjoying the cool of an evening. And whoa, hey, I am spotting a really hot gal. Her name is Bathsheba, he finds out. He sends for her. She comes to him. They are intimate. And she comes back and just has one sentence for him. She sends messenger with one sentence, I'm pregnant. And he thinks, oh, problem, but not a problem. I've got power. I'm the king. I can resolve this. And so he says, you know what? I'm bringing her husband back. His name is Uriah. He is a soldier in battle, and he's one fighting right now on behalf of David and Israel. But he says, let me have him come back, and he will sleep with his wife, and nobody will know the difference. So he brings Uriah back, and he says, why don't you go home and see your wife You've been a long way at battle, and, you know, this would be a great thing for you. He does not count on the fact that Uriah is a righteous guy, and Uriah says, how could I ever give myself that kind of pleasure when the Israelites, my fellow compatriots, they're fighting in battle, and they're living on the open field right now. I could never give myself that pleasure if, uh, you know, if they're in that kind of condition. David even gets the guy drunk two nights in a row, hoping that he'll be weak and bend. But Uriah is not that kind of guy. He will not do it. So David says, all right, I've got another card to play. If that won't accomplish it, then this will. And so he sends Uriah back to the battlefield, and he says, take this note with you. And he's a faithful soldier that he is. It's sealed from the king. There's no way he's looking at that. Little does he know... It's his own death sentence. And he hands the note to Joab, who's the commander of the forces, and the note on the inside of it says, place Uriah in such a spot in the battle in which it'll be the most heated and he'll be killed in battle. Joab complies. Uriah is killed. End of story, right? David's in the clear. David's resolved all of his problems not so quickly. Last week, I ended with this sentence, which is at the end of chapter 11. But the thing David did had displeased the Lord. He didn't count on one person in the equation that saw it all and was not going to forget what he did. And so David, this week, is going to be confronted by God over what he did. The two heinous sins that he committed is going to come to light this week. And this week really offers a textbook on how God forgives sinners. How is God going to forgive David? And by template and example, how does God forgive us? That's what this week is going to all be about. Before we get into the passage, and we're going to read the passage in just a moment, I want to remind you of something. This is all the way back from the book of Exodus. And if you remember, Moses said to God, I, I, if I could just see you, I would like to see you. Would you do that for me? I'm your servant. We're, I'd like to see you. And God said, Moses, hide yourself in the cleft of a rock. In other words, hide yourself on the side of a mountain because you couldn't take all of me. So I'm going to let you just get a glimpse of me. You hide yourself out, and I'm going to pass by you, and I'm going to declare who I am. God passes in front of Moses, and this is what God says. The Lord, the Lord God, is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving devotion and faithfulness, maintaining loving devotion to a thousand generations, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin, And yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. That is the name of God. It's the character of God. And that is going to be what's on display today. God in that character, in that nature in which he's declared who he is, is going to come today to David and disclose himself in those ways 
We're going to find out how David is forgiven by God today and the process by which sinners like you and me, sinners when we transgress the will of God, when we do things that we know displease Him, and sometimes we, don't, we, we do things we don't even know displease Him, but how, how does God forgive us in the midst of that? That's what today is all about. I'm picking up 2 Samuel chapter 12. We're starting in verse 1. This is how the story continues. And the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, There was two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought, and he had brought it up, and it grew up with him and with his children. It used to eat of his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock and herd to prepare for the guest who had come to him, but he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Nathan Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul, and I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your arms, and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if this were too little, I would add to you as much more. Why have you displeased the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you've displeased me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will raise up up evil against you and out of your own house and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor And he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this son. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. David said to Nathan, I've sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord has also put away your sin. You shall not die. Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child who is born to you shall die. Then Nathan went to his house. Lord, as I read this passage today, I'm just struck automatically by the fact that you are a God who sees all that happens, and that should make all of us, including me today, shudder in our boots, because Lord, you are a God who is indeed gracious, but you don't play around with things like this. And so would you give us ears to hear today? Would you, Holy Spirit, come in and do your work in order to disclose to us sin, righteousness, and judgment? And would you come in to do the cleansing work that only you can do? We are open to all of your work and all of your word today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Today there are going to be four steps to the process that David goes through to be forgiven by God. And those are the exact same four steps that God uses in all of our lives if we are indeed going to come to him and receive his forgiveness. Step number one is we are to confess, excuse me, we are confronted with our sin. It's a delicate matter to come to a king in the ancient world and to confront him with his sin. If you do that wrongly, sometimes it costs you your own life. This is the most powerful guy in the land. And so you've got to be careful in the way that you do that. Nathan is sent to God, Nathan the prophet is hearing from God, he's sent by God to go to David. And so many times, again, a Nathan comes into our lives who says to us in love and in the power of the Spirit, I'm here with you, let's talk. And those are always some tense times. One of my favorite characters in a fictional story is the unnamed little boy. He appears for a moment 
And he only has one little line in this story, but I love him so much because he, well, he swims against the flow and he tells honestly what he has seen. It's the little boy that's in the story of the emperor's new clothes. And he has the line where he stands up and says, the emperor has no clothes. Everybody else is fawning around and trying to pretend that they see clothes that aren't there. They're trying to make good for the king. And the little boy is the one that tells the truth. He stands up and says, excuse me, but there ain't no clothes on the king right now. Thank God for the Nathans that come into our lives because the Nathans really have our best interest at heart. The Nathans are the ones that are willing to make it their way through the confrontation and the unease of that and to be able to talk in candor to us when they see something that has gone wrong with us. Proverbs chapter 27 verse 6. Wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. Your enemy really is the one that's just always saying the good things to you and blowing kisses to you Never wanting to ruffle any feathers, never wanting to say, excuse me, there's a booger in your nose, all right? You got a problem right now, you got to deal with it. And that's what a Nathan does, that's what a good friend does. And so Nathan comes to David, and I love the way he does it, because he tells a story. He just doesn't come out guns a-blazing, he tells a story, and it draws David in. He tells the story, and he says, there's two guys, one poor, one rich. And the rich guy has more than enough sheep and cattle He's got more than enough to last a lifetime. But there's this other little guy, he's the poor guy, and he has one little ewe lamb. And the ewe lamb he has gotten from birth and he's raised it in his family. This ewe lamb is so important, he calls it like a daughter to him. He feeds the lamb at his table. He even sleeps and just keeps that little lamb warm at night. And then the story turns dark because there is a guest who comes to the rich man. And you got to rewind the clock and go, oh, ancient world, guest arrives, what do we do? We roll out the red carpet for the guest. It's a hospitality culture. And if I'm to honor this guest, then I've got to provide something for him. And so he's like, okay, we've got to provide a meal. But you know what? I'd prefer not to spend any of my own resources on that. I've got lots of lambs and, and cattle over here. I could kill one of those. But why do that? Because I've got also access to the poor man's little lamb. I'll take it and I'll serve it for lunch. And David hears the answer to this and he is incensed. David just goes off and says that man deserves to die. The man should have to repay four times over that lamb. And David right now is kicked into the mindset of judge because David often heard cases like this and he needed to adjudicate it. So David is judge right now. He knows the law well. And the guy, he said, should die and he should pay four times as much. And indeed, he's quoting from Exodus 22 in which if a lamb is stolen from somebody, it's got to be repaid four times over. So David is spot on in his analysis. Here's the problem. David doesn't know it yet but he has judged his own actions. David right now has found the error in his own life, even if he doesn't realize it. And step one is, is that we are going to be confronted by a God who never forgets. God is not the one who simply moves on uh, when he's displeased with something. No, he's going to bring that to our attention, sometimes subtly with the Holy Spirit, other times with a Nathan that's going to step into our lives and say, excuse me, but we got to talk. And that's the way that God operates. I was a pretty good kid in grade school. Yeah, probably not a surprise to you. But I have to tell you about the one time that I went to the principal's office. I don't even think Denise knows this story. I went to the principal's office over a schoolyard fighting incident. And I was not even the one fighting. So it's kind of odd of how I ended up in the principal's office. These two guys were squaring off and all of this crowd was around them as can happen on the schoolyard. I was kind of a part of a rough, a rough uh, elementary school. And so, you know, that happened fairly regularly. The teacher came up as they're changing battle, you know, changing blows. And he takes them by the scruff of the neck to pull them off. And he takes me too. And as he gets there, he says to the principal, I've got these here too because they were fighting. I've got this one here because he was egging them on. And it's like, aha. My participation in that moment 
was out in the open. And again, not suspension or anything like that, but I felt caught out because I had participated in that moment and was kind of into spurring on the battle, as it were. And so again, uh, you know, I was, I was caught and I was confronted with what I had done. Someone said this, most of us find peace over past sins by trying to forget and move on. We find comfort in the distance that comes with the passing of time. The further we are from our sins, the less we feel they mark our lives and the less guilty we feel. Do I remember half of the wrongs I've done? The truth is, I've conveniently forgotten most of those violations. And even though it may be convenient for us to forget, guess what? God doesn't. And God is moving in our lives all the time because he loves us in order to say, I'm going to confront you with what you've done. And in order for there to be restoration, there has to be that moment of this has been wrong and you've got to be confronted with that. All right. The second step of God's forgiveness is that we acknowledge exactly what we've done. As the story goes on, David shows his anger and his judgment. And then the passage goes into this long speech. So we've got the story told, David's response. And now God is speaking to Nathan and saying... I'm going to tell you everything I want you to deliver back to David. And it's this long speech to David. The speech has two parts to it. The first part is all the ways I've blessed you, David. And the second part of it is exactly what you've done. So first of all, he says, David, let me remind you, you have received blessing from me that you did not deserve. And he puts it into three categories. I've captured it with three words. I have them up here for you. First of all, he says, David, I've blessed you. Let me remind you. I've blessed you with position. I anointed you as king over Israel. I've given you protection. Remember all those times I delivered you out of Saul's hand? That was my love for you, David. That was my protection over you. And further of all, I've given you possessions. I gave you all your master's house. And if that wasn't more, I even gave you the wives that he had. And I, I just poured all of this out on you. And this is a great sentence is, David, if that had been too little, I would have even given you more. That's, that's how generous I am to you. Is I, if that would have been too little, all you got to do is ask. And I would have even poured out more blessing to you, David. But what did you do with that? You made some errors, David. You made some sins against me. And here is what he said in verse 9. I have that there for you. You've struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife, and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. So remember, he put him into battle. He didn't run him through. The Ammonites did, but God says to David, hey, let's, let's be truthful here. You killed him. You may not have done the act, but you killed him. David here commits three uh, errors or three sins that are found in the Ten Commandments. He coveted somebody else's wife. He committed adultery against her, and he killed her husband. Three of the ten, and David has committed those. David is spelled out to him exactly what he has done, and he is to acknowledge all of that before God. Today, it's so popular to be vague about our sins. People say things like this. Well, you know, we acknowledge some mistakes were made. Uh, we acknowledge there were some errors in judgment. I like this one. If I've hurt you, then I'm sorry. You know, but you know, if I've hurt you, and I'm going to put that on you now, if I've hurt you, then I'm sorry. And that is not the way the process of forgiveness starts with God. It starts with a complete acknowledgement. The unvarnished truth is what God wants to get to, and that is hard work. It is hard to acknowledge the pain that we have caused to others. It's hard to acknowledge the displeasure that we have, have done before God. And so it's hard work to get to that space. And it's not for the faint of heart to do it. It's why the world doesn't want to do it, but why God is saying, you're my people, and I'm going to have you do it. I ran across this week a scandal that broke in 2019. It seems like a, a, a century ago now in light of COVID. But the scandal happened in 2019, and it's called the Varsity Blues Scandal, And I have a picture here of this man named Rick Singer. And Rick Singer was this guy that helped parents get their kids into college or university 
because he had some people positioned on the inside that could make it happen. So you pay Rick Singer, and then Rick Singer pays individuals within the university in order to get your kid in. And uh, one of the things that he did was he paid, for instance, the athletic director at USC to get kids in because they could skirt around the entire admissions process if they came in as an athletic participant. So you had kids getting in that were part of the rowing team that had never rowed crew in their lives. You had people that were joining the soccer team that had never played soccer, and so on and so forth. And some big-name families were a part of this scandal. I've got two of them here. Uh, This is Lori Laughlin and uh, Hillary, uh, what's her name? Here it is. Felicity Felicity Huffman, that was it. Felicity Huffman, and here they are. And, uh, you know, I I, I wish I could say right now that I thought that everybody had learned their lesson, but 50 families that were indicted, uh, some of them pled out of court, but many of them actually went to court. And they had to have all of that occur in front of broad daylight of what they had done and how they had attempted to get their kids into uh, college by bribing somebody. Uh, Rick Singer paid a debt of uh, 65 years in prison and I think a $10 million fine. And, you know, again, I wish I could say that all the families had just come forth and had just pled guilty on their own, but that's not the way that it occurred. But what I want want you to see happen here is God is saying... Uh, one way or the other, this is all going to come to light. And it may come to light in, in, in a courtroom. It may come to light in your family. It may come to light all the way at the end of judgment. But count it for sure, this will come to light and you will be acknowledging exactly what you have done. All right, step three in the forgiveness process is that we confess what we've done and we ask God for forgiveness. Notice in verse 7, This is what Nathan has the courage to tell David. David, you're the man. Hold the mirror up. You're the one that needs to hear this. That little lamb in the story, that was all about you, bro. You're the one that went and killed that little lamb. And so this is all about you. One of the things that is true is we use a very similar phrase, you're the man. We use that phrase in a somewhat positive sense. So when we say to somebody, you the man, it means that they've accomplished something really big. They're notable. They're, 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 they're to be commended. And David is used, that's used exactly the opposite against David. When Nathan says, you're the man, what he's telling him is, David, you're the guy who did something bad and horrific. And David, in verse 13, says the most difficult words that likely have ever come out of his mouth. This is what he says in verse 13. Do I have verse 13 up there? The Lord, uh, let's see. No, uh, that one's later. Anyway, um, he says this. I have sinned against the Lord. I've sinned against the Lord. And I want you to notice something about that. Uh, he doesn't say to him, uh, you know, I'm really, I feel terrible about what I do with Bathsheba. You know, I, Uriah, I can't believe I took the step of killing him. He doesn't say all of that. He says something very simple. You know what? I've sinned against the Lord. My main transgression is against God. And I love a quote from uh, Mere Christianity. If you haven't read that book by C.S. Lewis, it's a time-tested favorite. It's, you know, all-time bestseller list as far as Christian books. And C.S. Lewis remembers this about Jesus. He says, Jesus is one who actually said he had the power to forgive sin. He says, we can all understand how a man forgives offenses against himself. You tread on my toe and I forgive you. You steal my money and I forgive you. But what should we make of a man, himself unrobbed and untrodden on, who announced that he forgave you for treading on another man's toes and stealing another man's money? He says, asinine fatuity is the kindest deception we should give his conduct. And yet, that's what Jesus did. He told people that their sins were forgiven and never waited to consult all the other people whom their sins had undoubtedly injured. He unhesitatingly behaved as if he was the chief party concerned, the person chiefly uh, offended in all these instances. And this makes sense only if he really was God whose laws are broken and whose love is wounded in every sin. In the mouth of any other speaker who's not God, 
these words would imply that what I can only regard as silliness and conceit unrivaled by any other character in history. But C.S. Lewis goes on, but in the words of Jesus, in the mouth of Jesus, in the character of Jesus, they make perfect sense. And so again, what I want to say here is we come to confess And we come to confess primarily and firstly to God. He is the one whose laws we have broken and we may need to make that way out and confess that to other people who have also been injured by us. But that's where we begin and that again is not the normal process that our flesh wants to take. Our normal process our flesh wants to take is to hide or to pretend or to shadow box. That's what we do best. And that's the easiest to do in the path of least resistance. So it takes a lot of courage to confess. Denise and I remember a time when we were living still in Colorado. It was a summer day. We were out for some reason on the, on the, on the porch or on the driveway. I think we were talking maybe even with some neighbors of ours. And all of a sudden, we, John, our son, is uh, upstairs. He's playing with a friend he has over. And all of a sudden, we hear breaking of a window and his, and his window was you know right up like this here we are in the driveway you just look up and there's the window and we hear a we're like oh, better go check that out so I make my way upstairs and I see the two boys kind of standing there kind of looking at each other hey boys how are you and they had taken the blinds and put them down <laughs> as if that was going to make any difference I didn't say much I just went over to the window up come the blinds. What happened? Well, you know, da, 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 da. you know, bottom line is we were throwing a ball around in the room and the ball found the window. No lunch for John, no, no lunch for John that day. No, no, that didn't happen. Uh, we obviously replaced the window. We made our way through uh, the confession at that moment and uh, all things moved on in life. When we confess to God, we are acknowledging what we did was wrong. And we are acknowledging what has been confronted with us. We're acknowledging uh, in detail the things that we know that we have transgressed against God's law and perhaps injured other people in the process. And that leads us to the fourth step, and it's the big one. The final step is that we are forgiven, and yet there are consequences that must continue on in our lives. Notice first that God tells David in verse 13, and here it is, and this is the one I had it before. The Lord has also put away your sin. You shall not die. David actually could have died over this. The two things he did were in, in Israel at that time were capital offenses. Adultery, capital offense. Murder, capital offense. David could have died over this. And God said, I'm going to be gracious to you, and I'm going to let you live. But David, there's going to be consequences. And the consequences are going to be felt in your family. He says, you know the way that you used the sword as your active uh, element? Well, guess what? The sword is never going to depart from your house. And David's life fell into utter chaos from this moment on. I didn't realize this until I studied it this week. But David said... The man who stole that lamb should now have it paid back four times over. And that was a a, a foreshadowing of what would happen in David's life. David would lose four sons prematurely to death. I have those here for you. Here they are. David lost the baby with Bathsheba that died uh, the next day after this uh, announcement was made. Amnon, one of his sons, was killed by his brother Absalom. Adonijah was killed by Solomon and Absalom is killed by Joab. So it's all within his family that this massive turmoil and this massive chaos is felt and God says, I'm not sparing you from that. Those are going to be consequences that live on with you, David. And I'm going to bring you back to a diagram that I gave you all the way back in week one because it has this arc of David's life. So this is Saul's life, and you can see that Saul was closing down while David was ascending. We are now at the red dot at the very top of David's life, and it's been up, 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 up. And now David's life, as a result of this moment, forgiven, for, to be sure, forgiven, but consequences remain and live on, and you're gonna watch the arc of David's story now go, boom, right into the ground. 
And David's life is going to be a wreck from this spot on. Forgiven. Eternal life. You're seeing David in heaven. No doubts about that. But David lives with consequences that go on. And those consequences also happen in our lives many times. We live with a certain scar tissue. Even if we are forgiven by God, we live with some scar tissue that extends on. I want to bring to your attention somebody that I respect a lot and I think he's a great coach. It's Andy Reid. And I have Andy Reid here, Super Bowl champion coach again. But with what I'm going to tell you, most of you probably would never trade him positions in his life because that is his son, Britt. Five days before the Super Bowl in 2011, so two times ago, his son, Britt, left the facility where he was also an assistant coach under dad, and he left the facility intoxicated. He was driving down the freeway at a high rate of speed, and there was a car that was disabled on the side of the road, and he plowed into the car, and a little girl was put into coma. As a result, that five-year-old girl almost died, but lived and now will be paralyzed for the rest of her life. Britt Reed uh, has served now a three-year prison sentence. I think he's still serving that right now. And although I, I'm praying, I, I hope that Andy Reid knows the Lord. I hope that Britt knows the Lord. And if Britt has confessed his sin and has asked for forgiveness, God is the gracious God who's going to come and say, it's people like you that I'm forgiving and I'm going to give a spot in heaven to. But I'm not erasing this from you, Britt. You will live the rest of your life knowing that this little girl has suffered in her life as a result of you. And I'm not going to erase that. And I love, we'd all love to say, well, but no, we know the story and everybody lives happily ever after, right? It all gets cleaned up. No, it doesn't. There are many times in which your sin has ongoing consequences. The abuse of alcohol can leave your liver with cirrhosis. That's not going to change. Anger in your speech can leave a broken family. The misuse of funds can leave a bankrupt business. Adultery in a marriage can lead to distrust or even divorce. And please hear me very, very clearly. It's not saying that this is an eternal issue. It's not one in which God says, I, I, I'm not able to forgive you. He's a, very able to forgive. And he's very able to atone for that through Christ. But so many times the consequences are what we will live on with. And that's hard. And it's a reminder to all of us of how small we are really within the whole scheme of God's great plan. I want to close with a story from Tim Callies, famous uh, teacher and uh, preacher and writer. And he tells the story of a pig and a sheep. He says, the farmer's pig and sheep had escaped. Together they found a weak rail in the fence and had pressed upon it and it broke under their weight Seeing their opportunity, they quickly bolted from the field and began to explore their new and unfamiliar surroundings. It didn't take long for the farmer to notice that two of his animals were missing, and so he set out to find them. But the animals had wandered far and had not left much of a trail behind them. Day soon, tur day soon turned to night, and after uh, resting fitfully, he resumed his search in the morning. The animals had now been gone for more than 24 hours, and he began to wonder where they could have possibly gone to. It was in the afternoon of the second day that he began to hear a distant bleeding, the sound of his sheep crying out. He then began to follow the sound as it led towards a nearby bog, and it was there that he found his missing sheep and his missing pig. Both had fallen into a deep ditch. Both had become coated in muck. Both were unable to scramble out. But where the pig had been con content to wallow in the mud, the sheep had known instinctively to bleat pathetically until the farmer had come to rescue it, to lift it out and to cleanse it. Then said the farmer, if you're ever deceived into sin and overtaken by weakness, don't lose heart. Go at once to your compassionate Savior. Tell him in the simplest words the story of your fall and the sorrow you feel. Ask him to wash you at once and to restore your soul. For if a sheep and a sow fall into a ditch, the sow wallows in it. But the sheep bleats pathetically until she is cleansed by her master. Be the sheep, my friend, and not the pig. 
That's great news for all of us. And today, I would be remiss if I didn't say there may be somebody here who has never confessed their sin to God. They've they've never felt the need of that. They've never said, Lord, I've sinned. I, I know there's a trail of things that I've done that's disobeyed you. At times, I even just haven't cared for you. And that is something that I want to make right today with you. If that's you, you've never confessed your sin, you've never said, Lord, I declare I'm wrong, you're right, and I wish now to follow you, today is your day. For the rest of us, it's a reminder of how this process of forgiveness works, and it starts with a real accounting of what we've done that's wrong. Let's pray. Father, I lift my friends to you, some of them in the position I was 30 years ago, when I found you. And I came to the spot of saying, if there's one thing I understand about the cross, it's that you died for sinners like me. And I said, today's the day I wish to have you to be mine. Lord, if there's individuals today here that are in that position, I pray that they would have courage before you to acknowledge wrongdoing and sin and say, you're the remedy, you're the medicine, you're the one that covers over the sin I've committed And I pray that today is their day to declare that. For the rest of us, Lord, heavy passage. And we thank you that you are the forgiving kind of God. And we take that to the bank today. We we come to you with anything that we know has displeased you. We confess that openly and freely, knowing that our souls can be restored. And even in the midst of sometimes trying circumstances in life, you will now give us the power to move on. And so, Lord, I pray for my friends that they would have that kind of honest dialogue with you today, right now. We pray this in Christ's name.